Conversations for Change. Motivational Interviewing for Tobacco Cessation. This video is produced by the Behavioral Health and Wellness Program in the School of Medicine at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, with funding support from the Smoking Cessation Leadership Center, SCLC. This video demonstrates the heart set, processes, and micro skills used in motivational interviewing as it is applied to conversations about tobacco cessation. Motivational interviewing, or MI, is a client-centered guiding communication style to enhance a person's own motivation for change or behavioral action. MI was developed by Drs. William Miller and Steve Rolnick for motivational enhancement in substance abuse treatment. Today, MI is an evidence-based component of tobacco cessation treatment. A key aspect of MI is adopting the right heart set. This involves approaching people from four underlying perspectives. Partnership, which includes active collaboration. Autonomy, a demonstration of respect for a person's unique perspective. Compassion, focus on a person's well-being and evocation, drawing on a person's strengths, abilities, and ideas for moving forward. MI consists of four core micro-skills. Let's briefly review each of these skills. The first core skill is asking open questions. Open questions are questions that encourage a longer response with many possible answers. These are not questions that can be answered with a simple yes or no, or a single word, such as with closed-ended questions. Open-ended questions help to fully explore a person's experience. The second core skill is to affirm. When people feel supported, appreciated, and understood, they are more likely to engage in the change process with you. You'll want to celebrate any step, no matter how small, toward stopping tobacco use. For example, if a person cuts down their cigarette use from 10 cigarettes to five, that is a major accomplishment worthy of a strong affirmation. The third core skill is reflective listening. Reflective listening involves both listening and reflecting back to the person what they said and the meaning implied by their words. A good reflection allows a person to understand themselves and their motivations on a deeper level. The last core skill is to summarize. Summaries make connections and linkages within a conversation. They can connect thoughts, values, and beliefs that the person may or may not be aware of. Summaries can also serve as a transition point in a conversation. And summaries from a positive perspective can also be affirming. Now let's explore the motivational interviewing process. You'll want to begin by engaging the person and laying a foundation for your relationship. This includes an invitation to share their view of tobacco use by engaging in active listening and demonstrating a desire to understand. Next, you'll want to focus the course of the conversation collaboratively. The goal of focusing is to reach mutual agreement to talk about tobacco cessation. This does not mean the person is necessarily ready to quit. Instead, it means they are willing to engage in a discussion as a partner. The final part of the MI process is evocation. This simply means using open questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries to elicit a person's views of their tobacco use and, should they decide to quit, their ideas about what strategies might work. Let's watch as a provider interacts with a 30-year-old female smoker named Maria. This video demonstrates how a provider's communication style can create conflict and disengagement, as well as decrease motivation to quit smoking. Hello, Maria, it's nice to see you. Hello, I wish I could say it's nice to see you, but it's never good to go to the doctor. Mm, unfortunately for me, I hear that a lot. So we're going to be talking about uh, ways to manage your blood clots and options for treatment. But first, I'd like to check in on a few things. The first is your smoking. You were at a half pack um, at, during your last visit, and we talked about how important it is for you to quit. 
I'd say it's even more important now that smoking is associated with DVT. So have you quit? No, I haven't quit. So do you, do you remember our conversation from our last visit? That's when I gave you the information about quitting smoking and the contact number for our tobacco treatment specialist? Yes, I remember. But no, I didn't quit. And no, I didn't call her. And why is that? I'm not ready. <laughs> and I'm too upset to talk about this. I don't mean to be rude, doctor, but I've had a hard time lately. And I'm not in the mood for you to get mad at me for not quitting. I'll let you know when I'm ready and we can talk about it. But here, now, today, I'm here to talk about my blood clots. Well, we're on the same page then, because that's exactly why I'm talking to you about quitting smoking. Because smoking is a major risk factor for DVT. Even if you, even if we treat you now, if you don't quit smoking, I, I'm afraid the blood clots will return again. Let's just talk about my treatment right now, okay? How successful was this provider in engaging and focusing Maria? Let's review the interaction. First, the provider begins with two closed-ended questions. Did you quit? And do you remember our last conversation? These closed-ended questions are conversational traps because they allow for only two answers, yes or no. If the answer is no, the provider has received no additional information and will need to ask another question to learn more. This conversation began more like an interrogation than a cooperative interaction. The patient's short answers and crossed arms tell it all. Next, the provider asks an open-ended question, but the question begins with why. Generally, open questions help to facilitate conversation by obtaining information and actively engaging the patient. But why questions can increase tension by producing a defensive response. We see Maria arguing to maintain her position. As she does, her resolve to continue smoking increases and she becomes further disengaged from the provider. This is the very opposite of what we would like to see happen, since the purpose of this conversation is to move Maria towards considering stopping her tobacco use. Next, Maria clearly states that she wants to focus on the treatment for her blood clots and not about her smoking but this provider continues with her own agenda. She does not acknowledge Maria's views, and the encounter ends in a standoff. So let's try this again. This time, the provider will use the motivational interviewing spirit and micro skills to positively engage Maria, resolve discord, and reach agreement to focus the conversation on her smoking. Hello, Maria, it's nice to see you again. Hello. I wish I could say it's nice to see you, but it's never good to have to come to the doctor. Uh, unfortunately for me, I hear that a lot. So we're going to talk today about how to manage your blood clots and some options for treating. Um, but first, I wanted to check in on your smoking status. In our last visit, I recommended that you begin to think about quitting, and I would be interested in hearing your thoughts. Well, I haven't really thought about it, actually. I thought about canceling this appointment because I knew you were going to bring it up again. Talking about smoking with me is hard for you. Yes. It's because you're going to tell me to quit like you always do. And then it feels you're just like everyone else, like my caseworker, the building manager. Everybody seems to think they know what I need to do, and nobody thinks I know anything. So when it comes to smoking, you feel that other people want to tell you what to do and make your decisions for you. you you don't feel heard or respected. No respect. That's it, yes. Well, I just want to say that I am very glad you decided to come in today so we can take care of this blood clot because blood clots are very serious and I know you're concerned. As your provider, I have to be honest and say that smoking can cause blood clots. But hopefully some of the information I give you today will help you in your decision to quit smoking. Having said that, I know my opinion is not the deciding factor. Quitting smoking is a decision only you can make. Well, I'm really glad I came in too. I have to get this blood clot condition under control, I know that. 
Would it be okay with you if I share some information about smoking and blood clots? And I can tell you what I know, and then we'll see what you think. Yes. I don't know that I will quit, but I will listen. Did you notice that in this segment, the provider used a very different approach? First, the provider begins by asking an open-ended, non-judgmental question that invites Maria to share her thoughts. This creates a collaborative start to the conversation in which Maria felt like a valued partner. You likely notice the change in Maria's body language and the way she begins to talk more. The provider continues by reflecting back Maria's sense of frustration and feeling that she is not being respected. Next, the provider states clearly that the decision to quit smoking is a decision only Maria can make. This indicates a support of autonomy, and its effect is a rise in Maria's confidence and experience of being respected. Finally, the provider asks permission before sharing information, allowing Maria to respond to the information and share her perspective. This type of communication maintains the partnership that has been established and assures Maria that they are working together. By the end of this video, Maria is fully engaged in the discussion, despite being unsure about whether she wants to quit smoking. We know this because we see her listening, contemplating what has been said, and agreeing to continue the conversation. In the next video, we will see how the provider skillfully transitions from the MI processes of engagement and focusing to evoking. In this example, the provider is strategically focused on evoking the importance of quitting smoking for her and the reasons she may want to quit smoking. So, what do you think? I always thought that the blood clots came from my mother. You know, like passed down, like genetics. I didn't know that smoking could cause this. I just thought that blood clots ran in my family. I guess I also didn't get how dangerous this clotting can be. You seem surprised and a little more aware now of the smoking risks. I guess so, yes. So Maria, I'd like to get a better sense of what you think about smoking. So on a scale of one to 10, with one being, you don't think it is at all important that you quit, and 10 being, you're ready to quit today, where would you put yourself? Well, if you had asked me when I first came in, I would have said less than one. <laughs> but now I would have to say a four. Why a four and not a lower number? That's a good question. Let me think about it. Um, I guess it's a four because of the blood clots. The blood clots are really heavy on my mind right now. So having a, a better understanding of uh, how smoking adds to the risk of blood clots increases your desire to quit. A little, yes. What else, if anything, makes quitting important to you? You know, the bigger thing for me is the fear of being evicted from my apartment. There's a rule that we can't smoke in the house, and I stick to it for the most part, but the other day I smoked out the window. And I, that was only the second time I've done it. But don't you know, the building manager caught me. So now I am sure she's going to be watching me even more. I can't lose my apartment. The possibility of losing your apartment because of smoking really upsets you, in addition to your health. I would hate to think that my Santi and Theo lost their home because their mom chose smoking over abiding by a stupid code, even if I hate that rule. I smoked when I was pregnant with them. And thank you, Holy Mother, they were born healthy. I don't think I could live with myself if they lost their home because of something I'm doing. So it sounds like your priority in life is taking care of providing for your children. It's obvious that you're a good mom. And if you had to leave your home because you were smoking, that would be tough to bear. Yes, it would. Let's look at what the provider did to evoke from Maria her own reasons for quitting smoking. 
Notice that the doctor did not rely on outside medical facts, but focused instead on Maria's values and concerns. First, the provider uses mainly open-ended questions and reflections throughout this portion of the interaction that are focused specifically on importance. Then the provider uses an importance ruler to assess Maria's sense of how important it is to stop smoking. Importance rulers provide a very quick and easy way to engage in the evoking process. Using a step down on the ruler, such as, why a four and not a lower number like a two? The provider invites the patient to talk about the reasons why quitting is important to her. Had the provider asked a step up question, such as, why not a higher number? Maria would have talked about all the reasons it is not important or hard for her to quit. The provider continues guiding the evocation process with more open-ended questions to further evoke and build upon the patient's change talk. Change talk is simply Maria's stated reasons for quitting smoking. Notice too that the provider reflects back what Maria says to highlight the importance of what Maria has said and its connection with her core value. Finding a balance between Maria's intrinsic values and her current behavior creates the best conditions for change. By the end of this interaction, we see that Maria has gotten in touch with some of her thoughts and feelings about quitting and why quitting might be good for her. We get the sense that this way of thinking is new to Maria. She seems to be learning or remembering what is really important, the safety of her children. Maria is tapping into her values and intrinsic motivation to quit smoking. In this final segment, we will watch the provider continue to engage in the process of evoking. This time she is focused specifically on confidence. Importance and confidence are the two foundational pillars of change talk. So let me ask you a slightly different question. On that same scale of one to 10, how would you rate your confidence to quit? Mm, confidence, ooh, I'd have to say a two. So you are not feeling very confident right now. No, no, not confident at all. I mean, I've tried to quit so many times and I just can't do it. So you've been persistent in trying and haven't been successful yet. Still, you, you said a two and not a one. I'm curious about that. Well, the only reason I said a two is that I tried quitting smoking when I was pregnant with Santi and Theo both. I went for two months without a cigarette with Theo, and I didn't make it past that. And I was really mad at myself for that. I really wanted to quit for my babies, and I failed. <laughs> I guess I'm just hopeless. I mean, who keeps smoking when there's a baby inside? It sounds like you really feel like you've let yourself and your children down, and that's hard to accept given how much you love your kids. Yes, and I'm doing it again right now by not following the rules. I'm addicted to cigarettes, just like a drug addict. In the end, the cigarettes always win. So what, what do you think Sante and Teo think about your smoking? <laughs> Sante yells at me, and... Sometimes Theo cries when I go out to smoke. He says, Mama, smoking is bad. So you know it would be best for you and your children if you quit. If you had the right support and tools to manage this addiction, if you believed you could do it, you would. I'd like to think so, but I, I just don't think I can do it. You quit for two months when you were pregnant with Theo. How did you do it then? I don't know. I, I just did it. I fought the urges with sucking on straws and some hard candies. I, I, I just did it. Wow. So you were able to quit on your own for two months. That's impressive. Have you ever used any other form of help like uh, nicotine replacement or support groups? Mm, no. I, I think people can quit if they really want to. I'm just too weak. Ah, wow, you must be pretty hard on yourself. What would you say if I told you that very few people, only 4% uh, of us, are able to quit successfully cold turkey? 
No, but I really? Mm -hmm. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and most people try many times before they're successful. Um, their medications and groups, at, and I'd be happy to share that information with you. I'd like to help you if that's something that you'd like. Well, I don't know. I, I, let me think about it. Can you give me the information again? Uh, the booklets, the brochure you gave me before? I didn't want to tell you, but I threw them away when I got home. But I really want to read them this time. That's great, Maria. Um, you can look them over, and I'll have our tobacco treatment specialist, Sonia, follow up with you. We have an excellent tobacco treatment program here, and I am, I believe that Sonia can help you quit when you're ready. Okay, what, when would be a good time to check back in? She can call me next week, and I'll let you know. I may be ready to try again. Absolutely, and I'll have Sonia call you. I just want you to know that I understand how hard it is for you to talk about quitting smoking, and I really appreciate it. So, would you like to talk about how to manage blood clots? Yes, that sounds good. All right. Here we see that the provider focuses on evoking and building Maria's confidence. She continues to ask open-ended questions and make reflections focused specifically on confidence, drawing out the patient's past successes and statements of ability. The provider also uses a confidence ruler, again with a downward question, why a two and not a one? The provider also affirms the patient's values and concerns for her children. Through this process, the patient begins to feel increased confidence and hope that she can give quitting another try. We see Maria smiling and sitting taller in her chair. It is only at this point, when Maria's motivation is high, that the provider provides resources and helps Maria set a plan to contact the tobacco treatment specialist. Had the provider attempted to move to a plan prior to Maria being ready, it is unlikely that she would follow through. By using the MI heart and skill sets across the MI processes, the smoking cessation conversation was successful. To summarize, we demonstrated the spirit of MI, acceptance, collaboration, evocation, and planning. We also demonstrated the core set of micro skills, open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summarizing. We showed how the MI heart set and micro skills can be applied across the four stages of MI, engagement, focusing, evoking, and planning. We saw the pitfalls of closed-ended questions and assuming the expert role in conversations about smoking cessation. We also learned how motivation is strongest when it comes from the patient and not from external sources. This module is intended to be an introduction to MI and explore ways to incorporate this approach into daily interactions with your patients.